The beginning of the Furry Man saga. Here we will have the colourful cast for this horrible saga. No real names are used. Me. A then new player, playing a dragonborn paladin, he had some unfortunate experiences due to being the favourite. Jack Puncher, a dwarf barbarian, the most experienced of the group. Didn't take no bullshit from nobody. Feather, an elven archer, probably the only normal person who was just there for fun and story. She got neither. <laughs> skeleton Man, our necromancer who despite his name, did not get to raise a single skeleton. That's just sad. Why have a name like Skeleton Man if you're not going to raise some skelly boys? <laughs> and our star, the furry man. Our beloved DM. Oh no! Oh no! No! <laughs> you can get by with having a furry pair because eventually you know they'll just leave if you just bully them enough. And they'll get shut the fuck but, down like, you as know, well. You can't run a game. Oh come, okay, look, like, you guys know where this is going. <laughs> Let's just keep going, alright? Our beloved DM with who you will learn more about as the story unfolds. And a bunch of randos who usually left after one or two sessions because they had a lot more common sense than any of our main characters. I'd like to tell you how the session started, but unfortunately I can't, because the furry man decided to start the session hours before the scheduled time and before the party was ready. Because Skeleton Man was teaching one of the randos how combat worked, and he thought that that was the perfect moment to start the campaign proper, despite half the party not being there. The fighting tutorial started with fighting skeletons in a field. This is fine for a combat tutorial, but not for the start of a campaign. So instead of fighting them in a field for no reason, they were suddenly fighting them in the middle of a small town, again, for no reason. So unprompted, the DM decided that they wanted to go through a giant door in the middle of the town, which had also simply appeared, with no input from the players, once again, for no reason. So they entered the very generic dungeon. It was a mine with skeletons in it. Now don't get me wrong, a mine full of skeletons is completely fine conceptually for a first session. 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 Especially with a new player. It was just weird how all of this happened completely unprompted with seemingly no rhyme or reason as to why it was happening and no input from the players. Wait, wait, so so they were in a field and then they got teleported to the middle of the town. And next minute, a big door. They, then they walked through a door to a dungeon in the middle of the town and it's full of skeletons. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong, I do <laughs> love my skeleton bodies. They're, they're, I, you know, it's like a default for me. It's like, you can either go goblins. Or, or skelly boys. Or skelly boys. And they're both fun. I really enjoy them, you know what I mean? But, um, yeah, I don't know. This seems Pretty like fucking a fucking random. mess, if I'll be honest with you. Let's just keep <laughs> Since the DM decided to start this hours earlier from the assigned time, Players had to be introduced halfway through. This started with me being introduced by simply already being in the mines for no reason whatsoever. Why was I in the mines? How did I get in the mines? I would love to tell you, but I don't know because I was never given an explanation. The second one was Jack Puncher. He was introduced by being inside of a box in the mines. How? Why? Even more questions that never were answered. You'll notice that this will be a common theme across the saga. Well, look, I'll give it one thing. I guess it's a dwarf in a mine. It's not that. In I a care. box. Well, why is he not fun? Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. Like, let's just keep moving from this. I probably won't ask why, but like, I suppose... They don't even know why? Yeah, let us know in the comments. If why? You this one <laughs> we defeated the skeletons and emerged victorious from the mines. We carried as much gold ore as we could. Which, after about an hour and a half long side quest, where the DM repeatedly stopped the game for tens of minutes of a time to look up gold smelting facts to see what purity of gold would be required for a single D&D gold coin. At the end of which, we were gifted our prize. About 50 gold coins for the entire party. Look, I'm Marvelous! Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but see, like, see, like don't get me wrong, accuracy, that's all well and good. That can be cool. But, like... But like, no need to go in that much. Could you be arched? Like, you know, that uh, also, can you not just say it's like some other mine instead of gold? Yeah. I mean, some, it's an iron mine. You know, yeah. I mean, something else. Because, like, you know, gold mine, yeah, fucking, like, give me all that shit right now. The, the players are going to spend the whole fucking campaign. It's like, right, we already got the gold mine. Let's just stay here <laughs> I know. Again, you know? In this mine, we find our main quest hook for the campaign. A book describing mystical cat people. With magic and technology beyond our wildest dreams which the DM ruined any kind of mystique or interest we could have had around them by choosing to refer to them only as 
horny cut people. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh my god, I fucking you know, I think I, I, I absolutely despise furries. I think they're like the worst, worst of the worst. worst. However Them them and pedophiles go yeah, hand in hand. I, they do go hand in hand in my opinion. But like the thing is, see like they're so much fun to laugh at though. I don't know, like the amount of comic enjoyment I get out of laughing at furries yeah. is enough for me to forgive the world of there being furries in it. No, no, never. Would you not Take that, that sentence back. Right, okay, <laughs> anyway, let's keep going with the story, will we? At this point, we return to the town, where we learned one crucial fact about the world, one which would have been useful to know during character creation. Magic was considered illegal, except for potions and divine magic which were both legal until they weren't. <laughs> what? And then they were legal again? What? The DM was flip-flopping between what was legal and illegal so many times, I cannot for the life of me tell you with certainty what was legal or illegal in any given session. Oh, like, oh. We, we've had that problem in the Westmark server though, so we have, and it, I, it always fucking, it's always just a beat in the deck dealing with it. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like, why bother Restrictions. Does it boil your piss, James? It does boil my piss. It really annoys me <laughs> when people are, oh, well, the, 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 this spell is illegal. It's heavy shit. Oh, fuck off. Suck my balls with you. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I don't care. And so my character and Jack Puncher decided to celebrate the best way two martial classes knew how to by drinking. This would later on reveal to have been a massive mistake by my part. Because after one failed constitution roll, not even a critical fail, the DM decided that being a drunkard was now a core character trait of mine. Well, one fucking one, heavy night on the fucking sash, is That's it? your character trait, okay. <laughs> Alright. And so, my character would get drunk and get in usually nude hijinks. Wait. At least once per session, where we were in a time. <laughs> what? Or with access to alcohol whatsoever, without any input from me. This should have been a red flag from the start, but I took it as a one-off joke. Unfortunately for me and the players all around me, it would not be. We begin the part two of our tale with the party leaving the starting town on our epic horny cat people quest. Honestly, oh, God. <laughs> I actually wouldn't be opposed to giving this a go if it was just a pure meme campaign. But it's not. It's a. It's a. The problem is, you know, the it's round by far. Yeah, the problem is, you know, finally the intent. The DM. Is expecting something a bit more serious, kind of. I hope, I think he is. But I, <laughs> I, I would, like, you know, this was like that knack and bark one. We did, yeah, yeah. You know, with the god people. You don't know the if the they're memeing or not. Yeah, like you know, and sometimes be like, you know what, actually, fuck, come on, this, <laughs> is, this will be fun, you know. On the way, we immediately meet Feather, who you will notice was not introduced in the last session. She was introduced by being a random trail guide with no explanation either to us or to the player herself as to why she was actually there. Now, an interesting thing about this character is that the player made her a child in elf years. Oh, no. Oh, fuck. This is a start. <clears throat> oh, this is this is it. We're going to start a bingo game. Does it involve furries? Does it involve paedophilia? Does it involve sexual harassment? <laughs> Does it in- You know what I mean? Thank you. Know. A fact which eluded the DM for the entire campaign. Needless to say, it made it very odd that she was a trail guide in the middle of nowhere, for no reason, with no connection to anyone around. And so we continued on our epic journey towards the horny cat man. <laughs> <laughs> we, I can't seriously at all. We got into some uneventful fights that were not worth recounting, and were mostly filler, until we arrived in the city, at the edge of a cursed desert, which the whole land is fucking cursed. cursed. <laughs> it's not just no desert, it's cursed. It's this whole fucking set. <laughs> Which the DM then informed us was actually hell. Oh, the cursed desert was hell. Oh, right. Okay. 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 Well, you give us some context. <laughs> you could actually walk to hell. It was like a mile from the city. <laughs> <laughs> Our objective was on the other side of... <laughs> Our objective was on the other side of literal hell. But to cross it, we needed to find a guide are two guide options. The first one was described to us explicitly as a weird rapist. He immediately hated us and attacked a party member for no reason. He was already out, but we definitely weren't going to choose him. So yeah, why was he even put into, like, was, okay, what, did you have to pay him in sex? <laughs> Is that what, is that, was, was that the plan? No, but he's a rapist. He doesn't want to get paid in sex. He just wants to rape. But so there's no point. Look, 
Let me right, go on. Okay, look, yeah, fuck. Come on, let's do this. So that left us with one choice. A choice that would haunt us for the rest of the campaign. The most epic, cool, badass, totally sexy DM player <laughs> character. <laughs> <laughs> he was oh oh I'm cringing so hard. Oh my god, I love that. He shit. was being executed, although we would later learn that he was actually immortal. So we don't know why he even cared. After saving him by giving them a different person to be executed, because that's how the law works apparently. He mentioned that he will only guide us if we steal back all of his stuff from a specific house because the DM already had an adventure he ran with another group and wanted to see what we would do with it. His words, not mine. After this mild distraction that takes about 45 minutes, we set off into hell, which apparently can only be reached with the power of the epic null furry DM player character. <laughs> Original character. <laughs> Weirdly fitting. <laughs> All right, okay. Well here, at least it's a null and it's better than being a cat person or a fucking wolf man or whatever. A gnoll is a wolf man. A gnoll's more of a hyena, but at least it's a bit different. A for, hyena man, I'm wolf man. I've yet to see a furry hyena. Are the furry hyenas? They probably is, but like, you know, they're not as popular. Oh, I'll give them that. Well, like, there's furry Origin- anthem at this a point. A bit of originality, never did anyone anymore. Jim, yeah. shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, you may think that an epic quest that sends us through hell itself, filled with magic, twists and epic adventure, would be fun. Its own arc. Possibly enough to be a campaign in its own right. We got through hell in about an hour and a half of gameplay, which, if you remember, was around the same amount of time it took us to get gold or turned into gold (laughs) ingots. (laughs) So, in hell, we discovered that it effectively tries to be the opposite of what you wanted to be. Until it didn't. You see, the DM had it set up so that if we wanted something to happen... We had to do a willpower save to think of how hard we wanted the opposite to happen instead. Until an hour later where he just stopped us having to do that and saying that it was never what he was having us do. Despite it being exclusively what we were doing for the past hour, funnily enough, a thing that we did want to happen happened and the DM player character got eaten by a giant hellworm. Unfortunately, he was not... (laughs) Unfortunately, he was back within 15 minutes. Oh, <laughs> no! <laughs> oh. Honestly, I don't... I, that actually sounds like a kind of cool concept. Like, you know, the opposite of what you want happens. But then it's very easy to break that. Yeah. It would be very easy to just like, Oh, well, I actually want this I don't happen. want you to die. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, it's very easily broken. You know? But I think it's kind of... I, there, was, it, there was a concept there, yeah. you know? Then we escaped hell. Did that seem weird? Anticlimactic. And like we didn't really do much? Yeah, that's because it was. Once outside, we immediately see the city of horny cat people. (laughs) Just there, on a hill, right after hell. (laughs) (laughs) Imagine, 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 like, you know the way, like, Dante's Inferno was seven circles of hell? That's to be one for furries. (laughs) Oh, 100. Furries, seven (laughs) circles. Furries, like, three. Furries, like, three of those circles. Yeah, they are. (laughs) Once again, Another gigantic city, a simple jog away from hell like all good cities. We were described how it was all cool and magitech looking, with large magical airships flying in and out of it. I'm sorry, is this fucking Wakanda for furries? Oh, stop it. <laughs> now the city might sound like an interesting idea, a good place to explore, filled with mystery and things to interact and engage with. Now unfortunately none of those things happen in the city, and it just served as a glorified world hub for the entirety of the campaign. Once approaching the walls of this magnificent city, our DMPC guide informs us that the captain of the guard was his father, despite being two entirely different species and being on opposite sides of hell. Maybe there was a coherent explanation, like an adoptive father or something of the like. If there was, it was never explained, and to this day, I have no idea why this is the case. Be honest with me, that wouldn't be the first thing I would be asking questions no. about at this point. I think I would have just given up on asking. Like, you know, so I, you know, I would totally you, give. I wouldn't what? be there to begin with. Once <laughs> I walk in, I knew it's fur. I'd walk straight back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, what's that one? That you know, no, it was, it was Abe going into the <laughs> Yeah, Abe <Eve> Simpson <laughs> going in, put his hat on. Whoop, that'd yeah. be me. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it would be. Upon actually entering the city, the captain of the guard, who had an eye missing due to his son because trying to kill your family is cool and badass and not at all edgy, 
allows us to enter the city surprisingly easy, despite our guide being a wanted and hated criminal by everyone. We learn that it's considered a hub among worlds due to its portal technology, allowing anyone to go anywhere in the multitude of all the planes of existence. All for the massive price of one silver per person. It's also at this point that we learn the backstory of my character is actually very important and despite never coming up before is now the main quest because the DM didn't think we'd make the, <laughs> we'd make it this far I suppose. So next up we have to go and imprison thousands of evil spirits before they destroy all the worlds across all the dimensions and so we set off into a portal into a cave which is a tale for another post. Stay tuned for part Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the video, but today's sponsor is brought to you by Neckbeardia's 3D printed models. Go ahead and check out the eBay store down below. We have tons and tons of really cool looking models. We've got it all from orcs, dwarves, the lizards and fish people. And yes, most of the sets you can get some big bitty bitches in with them. <laughs> and honestly, they're our biggest sellers. Yeah, by far. Yeah. All the models are printed and processed by us and it is by far the best way to help us out to do what we do. So go ahead and check them out below and just just look at this lizard lady with titties. She got big titties. <laughs> look at the titties! <laughs> so before we continue the proper story, I feel I should explain my character's background a wee bit more. As it became the focus for the next 10 or so sessions until the DM decided that he didn't want to be bothered by it being relevant anymore, and we never heard about it again. That's quite a good thing. Yeah. If I'm being honest with you, I, I think that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. My character used to be an initiate of a knightly order. He was in charge of guarding what was effectively a Pandora's box, housing both thousands of evil spirits and the order's patron spirit, all of which I released on accident. <laughs> Originally, he was tricked by an evil spirit to open it, but then the DM decided to randomly retcon that my character was so drunk and stupid that he went and opened the box which he was specifically tasked to prevent people from opening it. Oh why, he did that because the boy had a drink once. And oh thought, yeah, and he I mean, was drunk, it, that's he, his character. He thought it was really funny, it's like, you know what, that's going to be like the most that's your typical, thing. That's that's your typical <laughs> point of, of your character. character. You're so a drunk. Fucking deal with it, right? <laughs> Because, haha, I have decided your character is an alcoholic now because of one check in session one. <laughs> Seriously, okay. is there any chance? So my character's goal was to recapture all of the spirits and put them back in the box where they belong. All the while, with the help of the patron spirit, who hated me forever. Not because I released the evil spirits and doomed potentially all of existence to death, but because I was a drunkard even though that was entirely the result of the DM retconning everything about my character several sessions into the game because he thought it would be funny. <laughs> Fuck me. Look, it's moments like this where I ask, why are you still playing? But then again, I remember, oh wait, but we wouldn't get this beautiful story. Story, yes. <laughs> so, you know, like, your pain is satisfying As my our, enjoyment. Our, you know, so, like, no way I'd be like, like, why do you not just stand up and just get out of there? Like, I know. that other guy did it? Yeah. In the other video we were doing? Yeah. So we began our quest to seal these spirits before they destroyed the world, as my spirit tells me the location where we must go, and we pay a teleport to get there. We find ourselves in another cave with skeletons in it. I would like to point out at this point that we were around level 5, and thus far the most things that we had been fighting have been skeletons and wolves, so we easily go through the dungeon and discover our strongest foe yet. A skeleton mage. <laughs> Ooh, I need, I need, dun dun dun, you know. <laughs> so we do epic combat, and by epic combat, I mean I tried to cast fireball. It gets counterspelled, and the barbarian smacks it, and it was dead in one round. But then we met the real final boss of the dungeon, a ghost, which is the spirit we were looking for. And, um, yeah, big evil spirit that threatened the very fabric of existence dead in two turns. It only took that long because to finish it off we needed to get the last hit with a special soul capturing rock. After capturing the spirit we wanted to go back only to find that the portal was closed. We would later find out that we were supposed to buy a return stone that would allow us to go back from anywhere to portal city. You think it would explain that? I know. That's like a really important bit uh, to Fuck me. No you're just stuck out there. <laughs> <laughs> LOL. <laughs> 
We were, of course, only informed of its existence after we had already left by the DM, so now we needed to figure out how to get back. As we discussed our plans on how to get back, we're suddenly interrupted by the DM player character. Oh, oh God, here him. we go. I forgot about him. How's he going, He was also here now, despite the fact that we ditched him before going through the portal. Him having no idea of our plans, and the fact we were in a different plane of existence altogether. And he immediately began to offer us a deal where he would help us get back if we sold him our souls. Oh no! Oh my god! <laughs> like that's the last thing you want. I'm not getting this. I'm not selling my soul to a furry. <laughs> Never. Never. Sorry, furries are have already sold their souls. So I know they already have. But like, fuck. I feel like I should mention that the return rock was five silver. So he was trying to get us to sell our souls for one silver each. Are you serious? Naturally, we declined. So he proceeded to annoy us for the rest of the adventure. Eventually, Jack Puncher pulled out some devil summoning stones, which would summon a devil if thrown into fire. He had obtained these previously in the campaign, and he proceeded to toss these into some magical fire. Because at this point, we were more willing to make a deal with the literal devil than with the DM player character. <laughs> Honestly, I don't blame them at all. That's what you say. That's, I, I, the, the, don't the make logic, a deal with a furry, the, end of. The, the logic is not flawed, I will say. <laughs> So immediately a devil is summoned, and they are described as being of rather high rank. Cool, collected, and powerful looking, but they immediately break down and freak out, begging us to hurry up and make a deal, or the DM player character will unleash his wrath upon him. It's at this point that we learn that the DM player character was not only a badass, cool, cursed, and not at all edgy Noel, <laughs> uh. he was also immortal. Effectively a demigod. Gay! <laughs> and he has personally and single-handedly consumed the souls of millions of people who he also personally killed. But wait, why would you sell your souls to him then? For silver? Oh, fuck no. I don't know, this is flawed. I know. We're, we're just going with it, He right? was so powerful, he was feared in all nine levels of hell, in the abyss, and that the devil simply refused to deal with him for fear that he might consume them all. So after some quick back and forth, we get a portal stone and we leave. Very epic dungeon, 8 out of 10, would fight some <laughs> skeletons again. <laughs> then we return to the city, having completed the first step of our quest, and that was where the session ended. Next up, we went into another teleporter, which brought us to another cave. Surprisingly, this one did not in fact have skeletons. Instead, it had a large ice dragon. Blue eyes, white dragon. Fuck. Who would not let us past because she was worried for the safety of her child. Despite being aware of the super death spirit which had the full intent to kill her and her child right behind her, within viewing distance, just down a hallway behind her, but that she couldn't reach because the doorway being slightly too narrow. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I love it. I, I, I feel like I want to ask more questions. The entire way through this, but why though? I feel like, you know, like that child, like, you know, when you're like, why? 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 That's what I feel like. I feel like a people who can jigbox yeah. just asking why, but yeah. then again, I suppose why isn't the correct question, is it? It's why? <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know, let's just keep going with this, will we? Eventually, we convinced her to let us pass and deal with the spirit, which we did quite easily. Again, throwing another evil spirit capture rock. Pokemon? <laughs> Our way back ended up being much more dramatic than the adventure itself, as our teleport was hijacked by the DM player character. Of course. It is Pokemon, this Team Rocket, coming yeah. in, stealing like a fucking hot air balloon from them. Because he is the power of plot at his side, <laughs> and questioning him is useless, unless he's being put to death by a local city guard, in which case he can apparently do nothing. He immediately demanded that we hand over the evil spirit we had just captured because he was too lazy to go and kill and eat local orphanage. And eat what? <laughs> because he was too lazy to go kill and eat a local orphanage or something. <laughs> okay. So we give him the evil spirit and leave. Just like that. It's also at this point that we notice that we have been followed by the infant ice dragon who would become a favourite NPC among the party. We named him... Aw, oh, we named him Borble. <laughs> oh, nice. The DM then mentioned how the mother would be furious at this and hunt us down. She was never seen again for the rest of the campaign. Now stay tuned for the next part. I promise it will be a massive one.
Ooh, bitch. Looking oh, forward. note, I would just like to thank James and Megan from Nike Birdie. Yay. <laughs> from the bottom of my heart for reading my previous stories. Oh, that's so cute. That's nice. That's nice. Right, on to the next on part. On to the next part. We start this part of our story with the party relaxing and unwinding in a tavern. When we are approached by the captain of the guard, who informs us that we are going to be deployed into one of three war zones. Apparently, we had been drafted into the military because someone assigned our names definitely, into the signing board in the middle not, of the city. Definitely, definitely not the DM character that signs you up for that. Which we didn't even know existed. Who? Why? We will never know. So this presented us with three options. We choose to go kill an evil ancient jungle dragon, which had apparently destroyed 90% of the horny cat people's combat airships immediately after they came across it. I completely forgot about the horny cat people. <laughs> no. How did I forget about that? <laughs> we didn't have time to prepare a plan. We were immediately sent off to a supply depot a few miles away from the main military camp. Thus began the legendary show-off between Skeleton Man and Jack Puncher over who could run the fastest. Dice were rolled, and while Skeleton Man was spinning off at the speed of sound due to less wind resistance, Jack Puncher couldn't keep up with his little dwarf legs. Aww, I her. feel him I so know. much. This supply line back and forth lasted about three hours, which if you remember is about twice the time it took us to cross literal hell. After three real life hours of moving crates back and forth, oh my god, three hours, Jesus. moving crates back and forth, we were tasked with infiltrating an enemy camp. Because this evil jungle dragon apparently had prisoner camps staffed by vine zombies for some reasons. God knows. God <laughs> knows. Like it's a thing. Jungle. Eh, makes sense. Okay. I suppose. So we go in and engage in a very easy combat where we kill a bunch of plant zombies. It was at this point that the DM got increasingly angry that the fireball spell was incredibly effective against a horde of enemies vulnerable to fire damage and proceeded to go on a 20 minute rant about how he hated the spell and wished that no one used it. And so he proceeded to nerf it in an inconsequential manner that had nothing to do with what he ranted about. And then we finished up the combat. Among the prisoners, we rescued a bunch of horny cat people, including the big mean general of the army, and two gnolls who will go by the names of Ted and Larry. Two grown gnoll men who decided to follow Feather after she gave each one a good berry and they just wanted more food. So it became a running gag that Ted and Larry always ate all of our rations so we never had any. Keep in mind that neither one of them had any negatives in intelligence or wisdom. So there were these two fully grown average intelligence adult males following a small elven child and that was the end of that session. <laughs> I have no words. I feel like, you know, I could say something there, but like, it kind of just... It's it so good. I don't know. In the next session, we were again presented with three options on how to move forward. One of the options was to investigate a strange golden temple in the middle of the jungle. Upon arrival, we find the DM player character throwing fireballs at the gates of the temple for some reason. Because even here... In the middle of a cursed jungle, surrounded by the horny cat military <laughs> and full of plant zombies, we cannot escape him. After unsuccessfully forcing the gates open, the DM player character leaps into a tree and all cool and edgy like watches us from afar. And then we entered the temple, after Jack Puncher simply punched the gates open. Nice. <laughs> nice. Once inside the temple, we discover that it's actually a temple to the god of magic, who was also here. What? Oh, wait. Was, he what? Just, was he just sitting there in the corner in the temple? In this random temple in the middle of a jungle in person for some reason the first puzzle was quite simply a classic pressure plate trap which after activated by Jack Puncher shot arrows through the walls of the party. Luckily we managed to pass unscathed. After that one of the most absurd of all puzzles I have ever seen started. This one had a giant rock in one corner of the room and a pool of some sort in the other and also a briefly described triangle drawn on the floor we were somewhat relieved. Yet to realise what was to come. My first instinct was to try and carry the rock over to the pool but there were two issues. One, the rock was chained to a hole beneath it and two, after a short while of pulling it the rock would retract to the same spot damaging everyone in the way. 
What happened then was two excruciating hours of the party fruitlessly trying to solve the puzzle. Remember that triangle? There was just a triangle drawn on the floor. So the elf, after the two hours of trying literally anything else, who I would like to remind you is a small child, went up to the triangle and used Pythagoras' theorem on it, which worked. It turned out the solution was to find out the perimeter of the triangle and then write it into the Roll20 chat. Oh my god. Oh my god. That sounds like just... It had nothing to do with the rock, the chain, or the pool of water, or anything else in the room at all. It was just find the perimeter of the triangle on the floor. Honestly, I still couldn't do that. No. I didn't I, pass my See, this, this, see, this <laughs> is why players should not be given puzzles, right? <laughs> I hate to admit this, but when it comes to like DMs and yeah, all player characters are just thick as shit. Yeah. You'll never come across that Twitter when it comes to giving them puzzles. So yeah. It is true. It's just a thing. Yeah. And then we proceeded to go into the next room, which had a magical mirror in the middle. The mirror would show your true self or your greatest deepest desires. It was kind of random but not really consistent and what it showed you ended up not mattering at all for the actual puzzle. After a small while, Jack Puncher decided to try and punch the mirror. After a natural 20, he was immediately allowed to just skip the dungeon and get to the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, also it sounds like the DM was just getting yeah. up at this point and saying, oh, can we yeah. fuck? He spent the rest of the dungeon literally eating popcorn with the god of magic while watching us through magical cameras like this was Big Brother or something. <laughs> the solution for this puzzle was to just wait like 10 minutes for the DM player character to come in and blow the mirror up, which opened the door to the next room. Oh my god. Oh my know. god. That's, that's, honestly, this sounds like a fucking mess. I don't know. I couldn't spend the time doing this. Oh my god. See, after the first session, I just would have been like, no, I mean, sorry, I'm really busy. I can't make it. Yeah. I've got something on. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the next and final puzzle was to fill the cylinder with a specific amount of something after calculating the volume of it. There was nothing outrageous or crazy about it. It was just boring and uninteresting. Was this Jungle Lump? <laughs> I, I don't know about you guys. I don't know if there was like an American version. There was an American was version there? of Jungle Lump, but I can't, it might have been called Jungle Run. I don't know. Uh, it was like a kid's show. It was a, oh, it was a great yeah. kid's show. I loved it. So the Jungle and they Lump got was, little monkey statues. Yeah, Jungle yeah. Lump was based on Yeah, it was based on Red as fuck. And then we were teleported out of the temple after a pointless conversation with the literal god of magic, who was named Loki and was another LMAO random trickster god. Oh. He was in fact a super powerful human because gods don't exist in this universe and only really powerful beings pretended to be gods for some reason. So the DM player character is in fact a god then? Yeah. We're well, well, he said a de- well he said a demigod. Yeah. But- Fuck it. So we got out of the temple, did some pointless side quests, met a nature goddess who was a bee lady just chilling in the middle of this cursed zombie jungle, I guess. She only let us go because she liked the ranger. Since the DM knew that her character was a ranger and literally nothing else. <laughs> and so just assumed that she was automatically very naturey. The goddess also gave us some magical honey, which could just cure all diseases and heal fully back to max HP instantaneously if you drink a drop of it. She gives us like six jars of it because that's balanced. Eh, well, I suppose it's nice. Mm. I'll take the health potions, <laughs> yeah. alright? When you're given health potions, just take the health potions. Yeah. So never question yeah. them. But they don't seem to need it. All the fucking... Skeletons and wolves. All the, like, bosses and whatever they're fucking eating, hitting, or, like, they must Shame. have, like, 10 HP or something yeah. on them. Afterwards, the DM player character approached us and said that he knew a ritual to summon the god of magic so he could help us even though we literally knew where he lived. <laughs> and, and it was a 20-minute walk. But ritual time, I guess. After the DM described how he did some cool magic stuff for the ritual, like using his magical fire gloves to turn sand into glass, we met with Loki once again. He then teleported us into his special magic dimension where only he could use magic. He agreed to help us if we did one thing. If we beat him in a children's card game... <sighs> And if we bet something of value to each of us, the bets that were agreed upon were a bit extreme. He wanted Jack Puncher's strength, Skeleton Man's magic, my ability to wear clothes. <laughs> Your ability to wear clothes? Okay. Mate, oh. I don't like where this is going. And he wanted Feather's virginity. Oh my. What? 
So is this a ding, ding, ding part? We've hit the bingo. Ding, ding, ding. ding. Yeah. Sexual misconduct yeah. in a D and D horror story. We've once again, <laughs> once again, a reminder: small child. Now, at this point, we probably should have left the campaign. For reasons unknown to this day, we did not. And then we played a children's card game. Granted, this is probably the only session we all actually enjoyed. The card game itself was pretty fun. It was basically Yu-Gi-Oh. Oh, it's not bad. I like Yu-Gi-Oh. As you could basically scream out whatever would make sense for that card to do with no actual rules. After beating Loki in his game, he gave each of us a boon. For the ranger, this was a legendary magic item at level 7. For the wizard, it was being able to see all magic. He effectively had the detect magic spell on at all times. For the barbarian, he got more strength than a greater strength cap, even though he already had 20 strength at this point. And then came my boon, which was a black chicken, which he described as a black cock. Oh my god. Because he thought he was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> He gave me this after I said the word chicken in a previous out of character conversation a few minutes before. And the DM player character, who was also here for some reason, asked to have his sanity back because he totally isn't edgy. Come on guys, please. <laughs> and then the god of magic opened a portal into the forest dragon's dream. What? Who was in fact a spirit from my backstory that was possessing the entire jungle at once for some reason. Now for this fight, we were in our spirit forms or whatever. All that this really meant was that you couldn't use magic items because they didn't have a soul. Unlike all of our other non-magical equipment apparently. So I started a boss fight with a large, imposing dragon creature. This is probably the closest we got to an actual difficult fight in the entire campaign. Now before the fight actually started, the evil dragon tried to bribe us to his side classic I will give you your heart's desire spiel and then got cut off by the DM player character saying he's trying to bribe us that means he's scared <laughs> and then promptly initiate combat before we could do or say anything like in the start of this combat the dragon hard focused the DM player character dealing well over a hundred damage in the first few rounds of combat the only effect this had on the DM player character is that he willed his magic items into existence. Okay. <sighs> Somehow. Such as his magical great sword, which did like 2d10 unresistible soul fire damage, which also did another 2d10 unresistible soul fire damage at the end of each of their turns after they were hit by it once. After regaining his magical items, the DM player character flied up to the dragon, proceeding to get the last hit and kill the dragon as it was trying to fly away. I don't know where to, considering how we were within its own soul. <laughs> the DM then informed us how it was such a shame that none of us got the last hit on it, because we would have gotten a really cool ability, but it went to the DM player character. Ah oh well, better luck next time. <laughs> Fuck me. After defeating the dragon, a door just kind of appeared and then we left the spirit realm. It was around this moment that the DM mentioned that he had nerfed the dragon midway through the flight because he realised we might actually lose. Which managed to completely undercut all the positive feelings we had over the first actually difficult fight in the campaign, leaving only regret and disappointment. <laughs> it was at this point that we appeared back at the military camp. Because apparently while we were fighting in its spiritual realm, it was attacking the military camp in the real world, as a vine dragon, and we were hailed as heroes who defeated this great threat which had caused massive casualties and destroyed unknown numbers of massive airships. And so we received our reward, 500 gold, <laughs> for fuck's sake, which we had to share between each other. We were then informed that this was a commander's monthly salary in the military because apparently killing ancient dragons in the process of wiping out their entire military is something a commander is expected to do by the month. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't then we had a grand celebration for our victory over the dragon, during which the DM had my character get drunk and run around the camp naked. Before running into the general lady's tent, he then had me roll for charisma to see if she wanted to sleep with me. Of course, none of this had any input from me, 
As I was basically sitting there not saying anything as the DM was describing to me all the random weird shit they were having my character do. Okay. And then after the celebration, the next morning we were informed of our new mission. We were not allowed back into the hub world anymore because apparently whoever drafted us into the military had also signed away any rights we might have had. (laughs) And thus concludes today's story. Sorry that this took long, but as you can see, it's a bit long. Hopefully we will have the next part out a bit quicker. Thank you all for your support. Have a nice day. Oh, okay, that's nice. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the video, but today's sponsor is Elemental Games. Elemental Games is the largest seller of tabletop role-playing related products in the UK, and they also sell to most other countries at a great price. With 15-25% to 25% off Games Workshop products, it's hard to say no. However, they sell a lot more than just Games Workshop products. They sell every popular war game you can think of, as well as board games, card games and role-playing games. Thinking about picking up an airbrush and trying some new painting techniques? Or what about sprucing up your gaming table and getting some new terrain and battle maps? Then consider getting it with Elemental Games. But enough of that. Let's get back to the video. So today's story begins on a giant airship as we're being taken to a random ass village in the human empire from the start of the campaign. Because the horny cat people want to invade the humans. Nice. I forgot how bad this story was. So they could liberate all the wizards and magic people, or so they said. To achieve this, they sent us into this remote human village to build a forward operation camp for the cat people military. And by that he just meant... I want to run a town building campaign for like three sessions. <laughs> See, the thing is, this guy's got no idea what he's doing. No. Like, he's no preparation. No. I think he just shows up and it's like, this would be cool to do. Let's do that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So everyone decided what kind of building or establishment they wanted to build. Except Feather, who the DM declared was building a ranger station in the woods with no input from her at all. Jack Puncher made a tavern because he's a dwarf. Skeleton Man tried to make a hidden underground wizard lab in the mountains, but was then informed that if he wanted to make a hole in the mountainside using stone shape, they needed to hire an architect. So instead they ended up making a tar, because tars don't require architects, unlike holes in the ground. (laughs) Sounds about right. Okay. And then we got to me, where I wanted to use grow plant to increase the size of a tree so I could make a house out of it. The DM interpreted this as me making this massive, elaborate, intricately detailed tree house, as in a house made out of the tree itself, without any kind of role or hiring an architect, unlike everyone else who had to role. I was also informed after this that apparently I did all of this in front of the headquarters of an anti-magic inquisition in the small town. Right in front as in directly across the street from them, but... They never did anything about it, so I suppose it's fine. Okay, whatever. Okay. Really sure, why not? Next, we went into our first exciting venture in this new land. A small hamlet that was being plagued by demons, which the DM explicitly stated was inspired by Darkest Dungeon. We were hired to free the people of the hamlet from their devilish oppressors, who were in a cave, like anything else in this world, apparently. So we proceeded down into this imp-filled dungeon of wonders and disappointment. Immediately into the dungeon, we are faced off with imps. Skeleton Man asked if he could roll Arcana or something to see if the imps are resistant to fire. The DM said okay. After an Arcana roll of 23, the DM said that no, they are not resistant to fire. So next round, after casting Fireball and hitting the imps, the DM said that they take no damage because they're actually immune to fire. Oh, for God's oh sake. Oh, my God. Of course. Because the furry man still doesn't know how to balance combat. This combat still lasted by two rounds, one of which the wizard wasted. See, this is the, the, <sighs> the, the defining mark of this DM. Just not prepared. He doesn't prepared. know what he's doing. He just, like, you know, oh, and uh, that's okay, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you've got to start somewhere. I know, but like... like you know. If you're going to try, you should really, like, try. Have some, you, something Like, try prepared. to try, yeah. at least. <laughs> and, like, you know, if you try to be consistent. Yeah. You know what I mean? After proceeding further in, defeating imps, we reached the centre of the dungeon, encountering four succubi, a lightning succubus, a fire succubus, and two regular succubi. So we engage in an epic, thrilling, legendary combat which took three rounds <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> before all the succubi surrendered and then we looked at our prizes. 
piles of gold and gems. And then the DM spent over an hour calculating exactly how much gold this would be. Calculating the volume of a single gold coin. Oh, come on. The diameter and worth of every gem you can think of. And after this hour of literally nothing happening, the DM said, Whoa, that's actually way too much gold. It's actually silver. <laughs> also, a demon hand comes out of the weird portal and just yoinks half of the pile away. What? Leaving us with a combined total for the entire party of about a thousand silver. So a hundred gold to divide to our level nine party. So about 20 gold per person for the entire dungeon. Which I would like to point out is only twice the gold we got at level one. For harvesting gold from a mine in the first season. Also, apparently the people who hired us, despite explicitly having hired us, had never agreed to actually pay us. It was also at this moment that the DM chose to mention that Ted and Larry, our two gnolls, were apparently having graphic sex <laughs> with the two regular succubi in the corner for some reason. Of course. Uh, oh, oh my, my god, god, that's quality. There's so many whys. Yeah. What, what's that saying? Who, what, where, why, when? None, yeah. of, none of it makes sense. <laughs> so then we returned to town with the succubi in tow because they had just decided that they were going to follow us forever now, for some reason. It was at this point that Skeleton Man got a letter from the cat people telling him to make a magic college for some reason. Immediately after agreeing, the cat people sent Skeleton Man eight magic students, which in turn meant that the DM gave him eight blank character sheets with nothing but a class and told him to fill in everything, which Skeleton Man did. <laughs> what? That's... You shouldn't have paid <laughs> him to do that. The students would never show up or be relevant to anything else, ever. After another session of boring town building where nothing happened, we were given our next mission by the horny cat people. This mission was to go rescue a noble who was an alchemist from a noble party in the capital of the human empire, which was apparently a day away in carriage from our village, despite our village being described as being very remote and in the mountains. Everyone got a nice, typical, fancy-looking disguise of sorts. Except for Skeleton Man, who decided he was going to wear a gold-plated suit, have one of the succubi turn into a tiger, which they would ride on, <laughs> and another turn into an exotic parrot. Needless to say, he was being a bit extravagant. Now, this story was written... Well, it, the story happens a long time before Tiger King comes out. <laughs> just in case anyone thinks it's an African star. <laughs> the carriage was also driven by the DMPC, because we will never escape him. Once inside the actual party, I was immediately confronted by a group of dragonborn nobles who asked me where they could meet the king. Keep in mind that at this point the DM had never given us any sort of lore about this country, surrounding countries, or anything of the sort, so I didn't even know who these people were. After saying that I didn't know where the king was, they angrily stomped out, and then the DM informed me that they had just started a war less than five minutes into the party. This would never come up or be relevant again. <laughs> So we began to try and rescue the alchemist noble. After finding him, we asked him to follow us. He replied by saying that he couldn't simply walk out of the party or they would find him. And so we went to his mother, the actual queen of the human empire, who could do nothing about the human empire trying to kill him, apparently. She told us that we had to leave through the secret, secret passage, because apparently the regular secret passage was common knowledge. <laughs> we, we, we took... So why does this, none of this make sense? Know. We took the alchemist down to the secret, secret passage, which was blocked by two guards, whose armour made them immune to magic, like all of it, as a concept. Thankfully, this armour apparently gave them no resistance to being stabbed by a dagger, which killed them instantly. Then we escaped the city and rode away in our carriage. This was followed with half an hour of the DM complaining how he prepared all of this material for intricate political manoeuvring and that we didn't engage with any of it despite the fact we had no reason to engage with it, and we had no idea who these people were, what they were doing, and why we should care. And the DM would not answer any questions about any of these subjects. We then took the alchemist back to our village, who decided to live in the magical school. He was never seen or heard from again, much like everything else that entered the magic school. Then, after one final session of town building, where once again, nothing happened, our town was attacked by a strange bug-like creature who were capable of spitting some sort of mucus which could give you an extremely deadly disease. 
So we ventured into the forest to find these bugs, which we did, almost immediately. We found a group of about six of them, which engaged us in combat, which was very easy. Except for the last bug, who despite taking about five times the amount of damage of any other identical bugs did, (laughs) ran away without a problem. After asking if we could chase him, the DM replied with a sound, NO! Despite the bug having 30 feet of movement speed, us having people faster than that, and the fact that we had a ranger, we weren't allowed to chase it for absolutely no reason other than the DM just saying no. With no further explanation, of course, this ended up not mattering, as these bugs were never mentioned or relevant again. (laughs) Sounds about right, to be honest with you. (laughs) This was also the session which made Skeleton Man take the wise decision of simply leaving the campaign. Because he had enough of the DM's bullshit after infinite health bug, he still never got to raise a single skeleton for his entire stay in the company. Oh, that's so sad. And this is where the story ends. In the next post, we'll be following the party's adventure doing something completely different, because both the town building plot and the insect plot were dropped, never to be seen again after that session. We start today's story with the DM telling me that my holy spirit, who has been asleep ever since the big plant dragon fight, is not feeling all too well, and that I no longer have my paladin powers, and to get them back I would need to go to a special snake people clan in the desert continent. Which was maybe briefly mentioned in the previous sessions, I think. The party followed Sid, as this was the main quest now, and they didn't really have anything better to do. (laughs) Before we set off on our journey, Jack Puncher received a letter from his mining sources, saying that a mine was being overwhelmed by, guess what, skeletons. And the mine just so happened to be on the way to the snake people place. So we are doing this side quest now, I suppose. Upon arrival, we learn that the skeletons appear to have some sort of tremor sense, as they always knew where the dwarves were mining. So our ingenious plan was to get all the explosives from the dwarves and blow them all up. After the explosion, the party got separated, with me and Jack Puncher on one side, and Feather with another rando on the other. The way back to the camp was clear for me and Puncher, but Feather had her whole little side quest to find her way back. On the way, she not only found valuable gems, but also a small kobold colony. As a child without much sense of what money was or how gems were worth, she gave most of the gems away to the kobolds, who decided to follow her like she was their queen or something, and as thanks, they showed her a secret passage back to the dwarf camp. After yet another drunken escapade, we finally made it to the snake people place where their main priestess told me that, apparently, a fraction of the big evil plant dragon spirit got into my soul, and is now slowly taking over my good spirit. Yes, that same big evil dragon spirit whose soul got decimated and eaten by the DM player character. What? I've no, honestly, uh, I have no idea at this point. I'm just just going with it. This entire like, let's let's not try and kid ourselves if any of this makes sense. So, let's uh, just not kid ourselves. We'll just go with it. Apparently a hundredth of his soul got into my body some way and started to possess me. When asked why, the priestess replied with, because they are cousins. Which is a thing that my spirit didn't mention at all during the whole time we were working against them, but whatever. <laughs> yep. As I say, don't even try and make sense of it at this point. Oh we're, too my God. we're too deep in to okay. even try. Afterwards, the snake priestess informed us of our next big quest. The human empire had gotten their hands on an ancient artifact crown, which granted the emperor invulnerability and his soldiers immortality, and was planning on assaulting the desert continent and dominate its warring clans. But she also told us that the desert continent had a second, lesser ancient immortality gifting artifact crown that was shattered into pieces, and each clan held one of the pieces of the MacGuffin crown. It is a fucking MacGuffin. You know, fine, like, it's, it's, it get the thing to do the thing yeah. and do the thing, you know? Yet all but one of those pieces became irrelevant, as even the furry man himself could see that his campaign was dying, and he just wanted to get this one last pot point dealt with. At least he's admitting it to himself. <laughs> yeah. That's the only good thing. Eventually we made it to the first and only clan that we were going to convince to give us their piece of the MacGuffin, which was, coincidentally, the Dragonborn clan. At which point, the DM unloaded a whole backstory's worth of information about my character's background, all of which was made entirely by him, with absolutely no input from me whatsoever. He just added a whole lot of stuff to my background without consulting me, 
but this was basically the end of the campaign, so whatever. The Dragonborn weren't going to give us their piece of the MacGuffin, because there was a huge debate between the two Dragonborn princes, as the king was close to dying of old age, and whoever the next ruler was going to be would get the MacGuffin piece. After attempting some good old diplomacy to convince them to give us the MacGuffin piece if we helped them win, we came upon the conclusion that they were both complete dicks and wouldn't help us, despite us getting some decent rolls and persuasion checks. What came after was a few hours of Feather in the DM discussing about dwarf and dragonborn blood types, whether they were compatible or not, and about vague dragon blood related rules and traditions. This resulted in the rest of the party being absolutely, utterly bored. But the end result was turning Jack Puncher into a legal dragonborn via dragon blood infusion. I'm pretty sure dwarves and dragonborns hate each other though, do they not? I'm not sure. Is that sure. not a thing? I can't remember. And so, this random dwarf, who got a blood infusion like five minutes ago, walked up to the dying king and, after a good persuasion roll, convinced him to give him the heritage to rule the dragonborn clan. But the king's sons were very rude and unnecessary dicks. <laughs> And it worked wonders somehow. I, like, I'm not even gonna like. You know what I think by this? Does this mean he turned Jack Puncher into a furry? Did he turn him into a scaly by doing that? Mm, yeah, like, well, he, he, like, like, he, he did turn him into a dragonborn. And normally, I'm not one to be oh, dragonborn of furries, you know. But <laughs> like, in this situation, it sounds likely to me. I'm just point, I'm just putting that out there, right? After getting the dragonborn piece, we learned that the snake priestess had gotten all of the other pieces in the time span that it took us to get one by herself just like that <laughs> and so she, she and so she united all the pieces into the mega but not so mega macguffin crown which apparently got the attention of the gods not gods enough to give each of us a wish spell but considering how the dm had completely disregarded our backstories and our characters didn't really have any goals anymore none of the wishes were really relevant except for feather Feather wished that Borpal learned how to fly and talk, and the DM player character, which wished for a brand new world, which was actually going to be a plot device to get us into a new campaign, one DM'd by yours truly. Oh, the, the actual that... author of this? Could be. Oh. I hope he's a better DM than this guy. Yeah. I'm sure you got... You, uh... Yeah, let's yeah, hope. I, I, hope you, I hope it turns out well. <laughs> However, instead of falling into the endless abyss of cringe and suffering that would be having the furry man as PC, yeah, actually, yeah, I instead made my own server without him and hosted my own game, free of his shenanigans and weird plot points. All the while, he freaked out all about it in the background. Everyone celebrated gleefully that night. <laughs> I can imagine. I can honestly imagine. 